Welcome everybody. My name is Markus Vahala representing No Labels, No Walls, Action Monday, coming live from Finland, from all over the world. We welcome you to this wonderful show today with environmental art and all things nice. Uh, this uh, recording will be available to you uh, later on on CNTV, Citizen Network TV on YouTube. So please subscribe today and uh, watch all the other Action Mondays too. So I'm, I'm really glad that we are all here today. And our host today is Chloe. Welcome to the show, Chloe. How are you doing? I'm good. Where are you now, Chloe? Um, I'm from Glasgow. That's where I'm from. Um, doing really well. Don't like this, what we're in just now, but I'm doing good. Uh, as a host, Chloe, would you like to ask people how they are doing and where are they from? Um... I'll start with Alistair, where are you from? Hello, Chloe. Thanks Hello. for having me. Hello. I'm from sunny Aberdeen, and it actually is for once. It's been a lovely day today and a lovely day yesterday uh, in Scotland. So great to see you, Chloe. Good to see you too. Um, Kevin. Uh, hello there. I'm hello. from Connecticut. Kevin from Connecticut, how are you doing? I'm good. good. good Where are here. you from? I said Connecticut. Oh, okay. Yeah, Kevin from Connecticut. Let that ring out. <laughs> <laughs> um, fiance. Hello, I'm streaming for Scotland. Today it's a nice day, and yesterday it was. A bit cloudy yesterday. Glad to be here again. Thank you. Um, Keith. Hello. Hello. Hi, Chloe. Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is Keith from Connecticut. No, 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 no. Keith from <laughs> Glasgow. Sorry, everybody. So I'm sitting here in my attic here in Glasgow on a been a nice day. So. Nice to see everyone. Looking forward to today's event. Um, Poppy. I can't hear her. She's turning it herself. Poppy, can you unmute yourself, please? No, it's okay. How are you doing? I can't hear that. Ah, your microphone is not. Perhaps, Chloe, you would like to ask somebody else and Poppy fixes her microphone. <laughs> Hello, Chloe. My name is Hello. Layla. Hello, Chloe. Um, I'm Layla and I am calling from... Dover in South UK. Oh. So how are you? Who, me? Yeah. Oh, I'm fine. I'm just in my room and it's cold and cloudy here in, here in South Uh Michael. Hi, I'm Michael from Strindberg from Los Angeles. And I'm Mary from Strindberg from Los Angeles, originally from Finland. And it's sunny here, and nice and warm. Well, it's cold here. I wish it was sunny if it's cold. Um, can't pronounce um, people's names. 
Um, we can um, help. Did yeah, you? we can help. Uh, there is Nisley who hasn't introduced herself yet. Maybe you can ask her. Hello. Sure, good morning or afternoon, Chloe. Uh, I'm Nisley. I am here in Los Angeles. And yes, um, it is a nice day. It's good to be here. Looking forward to today's discussion. And um, then from my view, there's Fiona and Jonathan. Did you want to ask from them? Yeah. Hello. Hello there. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. It's Fionathan from, from Galway, Ireland. Yeah. We, it seems like every time we get on the call, we have the laundry going. We don't do laundry continuously, but I hope it's not too loud in the background there. Uh, what about uh, the Steve? You haven't okay. yet, All right? Thank you. Hi, Chloe. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hope you're all doing well. It's great to see you all again. All is well here. Um, what about uh, Rico? Yeah. Hi, Chloe. Hello. Yes, I'm doing fine. And something really interesting is here, ready for the picture show. We'll see it out. Thank you. Um, well, you're welcome. Chloe, did you ask Matt yet? No. Hello. Hi, Chloe, and hello, everybody. I'm Matt, and I'm in a town called Maidstone, which is in the southeast of England. And uh, it's, it's quite a nice day. It's a good day. Chloe, did you ask uh, Julia yet? Mm, no. Oh, okay. Hi, Chloe. Hi, everyone. I'm from Southeast England as well, and it has been a sunny day. And it was Layla that um, told me about this. So thank you to Layla. Hey. Um. Um, and did uh, Poppy, is your audio working yet? No. It's okay. No. Oh, it's okay. Poppy, it's the same difficulty that you was having last week, wasn't it, on, on the call that we had? So it's something to do with the machine that you got downstairs. Have you got another computer you could connect to? What about her sister's one? Steve. Yeah, I think that's right, Layla. I think that's how she usually. She did it last week. I think she's gone to try now, so hopefully she'll rejoin us. Oh, Poppy. Oh, bless her. <laughs> um, all right. Is that everybody? Is there somebody, Chloe, ask if somebody you haven't asked yet? I've not asked. I can't pronounce his name. Uh, is there Peter? Peter Blanche, who just came in. Hello. Keep 
Peter. All right. Hi, Peter. Welcome. And uh, I believe, uh, isn't there Adam who just came as well? And I think then we have everybody. Uh, Adam. Hey. Hi. Hey. And uh, um, all right, I think that's everybody. Thanks, thank Chloe. Well done. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's turn it over now to Sue Neal, um, who's going to be talking about environmental justice, and then we'll get Layla, and then we'll get everybody um, to uh, join in on the activity. Uh, please, if you haven't already, uh, put your uh, get together at least in your mind. Uh, what image for, from the environment that means something to you? All right, Sunil, it's all yours. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, okay. So, uh, so just to reintroduce myself, I am from Hull in England. My name is Sunil Murlidhar Shastri. Uh, I'm a consultant, expert, and speaker in ocean and environmental governance and director of Ocean Governance Limited based in the UK. Uh, in fact, literally, literally a couple of minutes ago, the sun was still shining here, so spring can't be very far. It's quarter past five almost, and if you have the sun shining at this, this time, I think we are near the spring now, so that's a positive take. So I want to start by saying that, okay, today's theme is uh, environmental justice, uh, and my, my subtitle I have chosen myself is looking back to look forward. So basically, I want to just go back uh, maybe 50, 70 years or maybe even longer and then uh, see where we are in terms of environmental justice or why, we, why do we need something called environmental justice. So to go into the topic itself before that, I have a, um, I have a logo on, of ocean governance. If you go on my website, you will see that. And it's got six little circles below ocean governance. And those six little circles are people, so that's us, planet, which is the planet, the only planet we have, and prosperity or profits or whatever you like to call that. So we all want to have a prosperous planet and a prosperous people. So that's our starting point. But obviously we are not achieving that. So the way to achieve that in my view would be if we can achieve some sort of, some semblance of equity and to achieve that equity, we need some kind of justice and that will lead to justice also. The equity also will lead to justice and eventually it will lead to peace. So that's the idea. So people, planet, profit, equity, justice, peace. So those are my kind of keywords. I want to start with three examples of how policy lags science. So how this whole business of environmental justice lag science. So we understand science early, but we don't, don't convert that into policy, sometimes to the frustration and exasperation of scientists. Politics and business have a rather narrow window of outlook. Policies relating to marine science, fishing and environmental and climate science, and ecological science. So all of these are just examples, just three examples to see how the, the, the lag of policy and the narrow mind or the narrow outlook or the narrow window that politics and business have. Now, politics generally has a window of five years because that's when the re-elections take place. Business have a similar window because the chief executive sees the bottom line and his, his reappointment as a chief executive or her uh, reappointment as a chief executive in five or 10 years time. So once again, the window is not very long and that's the, that's the important problem. So if we go back, uh, say several hundred years ago, 
uh, John Cabot, who was the first Anglo-Saxon to have sailed from Bristol to the present day New Newfoundland and Labrador and Nova Scotia, famously wrote in 1498 that the progress of his ship, the Matthew, and others was impeded by cod. So the cod was so plentiful that the ships were actually impeded uh, because of the presence of the cod in the sea. Hugo Grotius, or Hugo de Groot, the father of international law, famously wrote in Mare Liberum in 1609 that fish, fish could be taken ad infinitum, meaning that you could take as much fish as you liked this season and the next and the next and so on and fish would be inexhaustible. Jules Verne, the famous Frenchman, in his, in his book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, wrote that cod was so plentiful in the Atlantic that if you didn't fish them for three seasons, you could walk from Europe to America on the Atlantic. So that was, you know, that was the idea that, you know, cod would fill the Atlantic chocker block. Forget the poetic license, but that shows how plentiful fish was. In 1883, so coming back closer to our times from 14th, 15th century, in 1883, T.H. Huxley stated, and T.H. Huxley was a no mean man. He was a president of the Royal Society that year. And he said, I believe then that cod fishery and probably all great fisheries are inexhaustible. So take the word inexhaustible or, you know, uh, the fisheries are plentiful. That is to say that nothing we can do seriously affects the number of fish. And any attempts to regulate the fisheries seem to be useless. So it's pointless to regulate fish because there's so much fish. And he was the president of the Royal Society, like I said. But a friend of his had an opposite view, Alex Ray, Ray Lancaster. And this led to a debate between the two of them. And then the very next year he came back and he says that there is a contrary evidence that school of fish or the shoal of fish like herrings, mackerel, pilchard, etc., the ground fish such as soles and other flat fish are really localized. So if man removes, man or woman, removes a large proportion of these fish, the natural balance is upset. And that was recognition in 1884. So imagine 1884 for the first time, we recognize that fish can be damaged by overfishing. But the major global policy to regulate it in the form of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So the policy to regulate that, the science was known in 1884, but the policy only came in 18, uh, 1982. Similarly, now we talk about another example, which is about global warming, or what we call as climate change. Swante Arrhenius was a Swedish scientist, a very, very well-known Swedish scientist, and he was a physicist and a chemist and he received a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1903. He was the first Swedish Nobel laureate and he became in 1905, the first director of the Nobel Institute. And he wrote a paper about global warming in 1895, 1896 actually. And he was the first to say that increasing amounts of greenhouse gases are going to increase the earth's temperature. Now, obviously we didn't worry too much about it then because the industrial revolution had just started then. And the time of the industrial, in fact, in, in the year 1800, the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 283. So remember, remember this figure, 283 in that year, in 1800. And then, and also very quickly to also tell you what the greenhouse gases are. So greenhouse gases are oxides of carbon, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, oxide of, oxides of nitrogen, oxides of sulfur, methane, ozone, volatile organic compounds, including CFCs, the ones that we use for refrigerants, and even water vapor. So they're all parts of what we call as greenhouse gases. And CO2 parts per million, which was 1800, like I said, sorry, which was 283 in the year 1800, like I told you, was 313. So incre it increased by just 30 from 1800 to 1955, the year I was born. So in 155 years, it went from 283 to 313. And today it is at 415. So in my lifetime, I'm 65 and it has gone up by over 102. 
So that shows you. Now the paper by Swante Arrhenius regarding global warming and greenhouse gases was in 1896, remember. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change came in 1992. Now some of, our, some of you are here from Scotland and the Asian phytoplankton, this is a third example. The Asian phytoplankton algae uh, uh, odontella was, founded in, was found in Scotland in 1903. And this is because of the transfer of water from one part to the other uh, as ballast water from one part of the world to another part of the world. And the IMO, the International Maritime Organization's Ballast Water Convention came only in 2004. So you can see this is how the, 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 the policy lags science and which is where the environmental justice suffers because we don't pay much attention to the science until the policy comes in and after the policy comes in, the policy implementation takes so much more longer time. And so that causes the environmental justice to be delayed further and further. Now, coming back to more recent times, and this is after I was born, so not before some of you were born perhaps, but Earthrise in 1968 was an iconic photo shot by astronaut William Anders during the Apollo 8 mission and is considered to be one of the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. You might remember seeing it, you know, uh, in the uh, sort of a blue and white planet rising from a dark sky and half of it kind of, you know, so that's called Earthrise, the famous Earthrise picture. A recognition that we are more a planet Earth, sorry, a planet ocean than planet Earth that we think, as Arthur C. Clarke observed. How inappropriate to call our planet Earth when it's clearly ocean. The futility of Vietnam War, the flower power generation, the student protests in London, Paris and New York, and the general disillusionment coming from you never had it so good from Harold Macmillan in 1957, and the white heat of technology by Harold Wilson in 1963, all led to the recognition of environmental problems and awareness that led to the first Earth Day on 22nd of April in 1970 in the city of New York. And of course, this spread all over the world. So that was, in my mind, the first time that there was what we call as environmental awareness, the creation of environmental awareness at that point. Now, there, was, there, were, there were many, many developments, but we also recognized early on after 1970. And 1970, of course, led to uh, that Earth Day also led to what we call as the United Nations uh, Environment Program uh, in 1974. Uh, before that, there was in 1972, there was a Stockholm conference uh, to, uh, to look at the UN environment and the habitat. So that was in 1972. And uh, the, uh, as we recognized early on, there were four threats to the ecosystems uh, by way of species and habitats getting affected because of human activities. One was the alteration and destruction of habitat because we want to build everywhere or we want to destroy habitat in order to create townships, cities, industries, etc. Global trade of flora and fauna for commercial scale. So, you know, selling wood, selling trees, selling animals, selling animal products, etc. Uh, across the world and capture during breeding. So breeding is a time when the animals are most sedentary and capture during breeding. And of course, capture during migration. So migration, they are mobile, the animals and birds and everybody are very mobile as against in, at the time of breeding. But the time of migratory season, they are very mobile, but we know exactly where they're going to pass through and we can set our traps and our, our nets and everything and catch as many of these animals or shoot as many of these animals and kill and so on. So one of the things that, that comes to my mind always is that for humanity, unless we can cut, dig, kill, uh, there, is, uh, there is one more, sorry, there is, uh, cut, cut, dig, and kill. And then the fourth one, so cut, cutting and digging and killing. So we, 
we have always been doing that animals have been doing that just as human beings have been doing and we become an ex- we have become experts at cutting digging and killing and changing the habitat changing the animals etc the only new thing that we learned as humans from 10000 years ago or whatever is burn now that is something that animals can't do and that is the biggest change that we we are bringing about in the environment by burning and burning uh, indiscriminately fossil fuels and other fuels and re, 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 you know releasing these global greenhouse gases into the atmosphere so some of the big things that were done in terms of environmental justice to achieve environmental justice are known as big 4 plus 1 so there is what we call as the ramsar convention to protect the wetlands to protect the wetlands for for alteration and destruction of habitat the unesco the unesco's world heritage convention uh, to look at the natural and cultural heritage and to protect the natural and cu- cultural heritage of mankind the the third one was the cites convention which is the convention on the uh, uh, trade of global flora and fauna on commercial scale and finally like i said because they were, we captured during migration so the convention on migratory species of wild animals and birds so those were the four big conventions which tried to bring some environmental justice by creating these new policies in the year 71 72 73 and 79 so these are all outcomes of that stockholm convention and then there's one more which is the big one uh, the big 4 plus 1 as i call it is the convention on the uh, on the antarctic treaty and antarctic treaty regulating marine living resources and that came in 1980 the antarctic treaty is from 1959 but this convention regulating living resources came in 1980 so and also to add to that in 1988 they decided that the antarctica will be free from mineral exploration of course now australia recently is trying to build an airport in in the antarctica and their their idea is to start mining there but at the moment at least Uh, antarctica is free from any mineral resource exploitation activities so these are some of the big uh, policies created in 1967 there was another movement which would culminate into starting a revolution uh, in the ocean and that was the creation of the law of the sea convention so 1967 the revolution in the ocean started and culminated and in fact the convention uh, started to negotiate in 1973 and eventually in 1982 we got the united nations convention on the law of the sea so now sea which is the 99 which is 99% of living space we we all learn that it's 70% of the land area sorry of the earth's area but it is 99% of the living space and that uh, had no regulation uh, no international law governing it right until 1982 so you can see how uh, how things have been Uh, delaying uh, environmental justice throughout because of our actions or our inactions rather so so also we re- we recognize that uh, long range and transboundary pollution was tra- was a threat so pollution that releases in one part of the world does not stay there it moves on and it moves normally it moves polewards it all goes to the poles and that we found out because of ozone ha- lo- layer depletion on top of the antarctic and also we found the warming of the poles the polar regions so those are the things that came and then as a result of that there was a vienna convention on the protection of the ozone layer and that sort of started to bring in reduction of use of uh, uh, use of uh, uh, cfcs and so on so then we have uh, the other developments taking place Uh, in 1988 we have uh, the inter- intergovernmental panel on climate change set up and that was the one that led to the framework Neil, convention on climate change sorry to bother you just want you to know you have about two more minutes if that's okay sorry you have two more minutes uh be uh is that if that's okay a couple more uh, minutes how many minutes roughly two, two more minutes uh two more okay thank you yeah, so yeah sure. so basically so uh, well, well, all i'm trying to show, show here is that a, a lot of negotiations a lot of policy has come in but it is coming in rather late in time and also uh, we are getting what we call as increasingly lawless increasingly lawless, lawless in the sense that we are getting landless 
airless and waterless. So why is this happening? Because our land is being overexploited, our air is getting polluted, and our water is getting polluted. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the big things that we can do is plant trees. Planting billions of new trees is the best weapon we have to bring about this environmental justice, to reverse whatever we have done, whatever wrong we have done, plant trees, plant trees on land, plant trees in the coastal region. So, you know, mangroves, et cetera, uh, and so on. And in terms of what we can do as individuals, industry and policy, throwing away less food, eating more plant-based diet, eating less meat, et cetera, or, you know, use electric cars where possible or use no cars at all if you can, if you can manage. Uh, using LED bulbs, uh, plant more bam bamboo, for example, or you know, plant, plant, plant trees in general, uh, use of, uh, use of uh, renewable energy, or re renewable electricity, uh, waste management, um, reduce, reuse, recycle, recover, and so on education of women and girls, et cetera. I mean, there, there are a number of things that we can do and we can bring about some changes. Uh, there, there was a report very recently uh, called the Das Gupta Review, re released by the British government. And that's well worth looking at. And it has got a short, what you call as an executive summary. It's only about 10 pages or so. So if you can read that, it gives you a general idea of what the world is trying to do now to reverse everything wrong that we've done in the last couple of hundred years. Uh, I just want to end by just one thing, by saying that uh, there is a renewed interest in our VUCA world. We call it a VUCA world in the sense it is a volatile world. Uh, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And it's always been like that. The world has always, right from the beginning of the world, the world has been volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous but the actions of human beings is making it even more so, even more a VUCA world than it was ever before. And the only way we can change it is by doing the right thing because it is the right thing to do and not for our short-term goals. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tunil. And Tunil has been with us a couple of times now um, so thank you so much for your continued, uh, um, Sunai? yeah, hold on Sunai? one second, Liz. Yep. We're going to get uh, there. Sunai? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sunai? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 I, I did a radio show that you, that I sent to you all about what you were saying about the environment. Yes, I, 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 I saw your, yes. I saw your radio program. It was very interesting. Mm. I heard, I heard, uh -huh. I heard your radio program. Yes, and I totally agree with you. It's, it's something's got to change. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. and and I think, I think people are moving in the right direction, albeit mm. slowly, what? but yeah. they're moving in the right, the right direction. And people are at least getting more aware of the problem yes. that we face. I think that is very important. I'm ready, Michael, if you want. Okay. Michael? So, yes. Hold on one second, Leila. So, okay. we just want to say thank you so much, uh, Sunil. Um, thank you. Everybody, we're going to now, um, uh, part of Sunil's talks, obviously, is about what we can all do to kind of, you know, create a better environment. For, for every for the planet and for us all. So one of the things we thought today we would do um, is cr uh, basically talk about things and places in the environment that we care a lot about. So to start that, uh, Layla is going to be talking about her scuba diving and yes. um, and she has a presentation about that. But if everybody can have an image, because right after that, we want to hear from all the group about a place uh, with an image of where you really uh, care about in the environment. And then we'll kind of create a collage that will hopefully bring awareness to, you know, uh, uh, you know, the environment and also how we can kind of take care of it better like Sunil laid out. 
Um, so with that being said, um, Layla, I'm going to now share my screen and Layla's going to okay, be talking yeah. about her, her scuba diving. Just one second. And I'm now sharing. Ah, oh, yes, Layla. And oh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Layla, you're up. Hang on, Layla. Hello. Um, my scuba diving story by Layla. Next, how I started. Liz has some amazing photos of her dives. That is like them so much he started learning to dive with her I really wanted to do it too so I asked if she would work with but both of us next <laughs> why I did why I want why did, did I want to, oh god why did I want to, to do it sorry why did I want to do it um I liked it I um, I liked it looked really cool sorry um I wanted to to join in I love being in the water warm warm water it looked like exotic holidays i wanted to make some new friends i wanted to do something where where oh god where people uh, would uh, beat me like everyone else my mum thought i couldn't do, do it do it Okay. I've been tapas and I had a try dive and loved it. Liz talked to the club about okay. extra time and support. It was agreed. Liz and the club would support us for as long as we yeah. needed. Yeah. We could pay weekly instalments for our courses. Everyone, including parents, had meetings to to talk about how how it could happen. We started. Um, this is my this is me bimbling in the pool with my instructor Roger. The course is about safety, 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 and knowledge. My mum wants me to try, try it. It, it. it took 18 months. It would usually take a week. Next, Michael. <laughs> I learned about my diving equipment, how to put it together how to make sure it works before you go in into the water, how to check my buddy equipment is safe and working, but buddy check, um, big women are fun, um, how to use it in the water and how to look after my equipment. Diving in British lakes, dry suit. It's too, it's so cold. Next, um, advanced open water course, our adventure dives, dry suit. D diver, night diver, underwater navigator, fish ID, project aware, deep dive, 30 meters, multi level diver, peak performance, buoyancy. 
Next, holiday in Gozo, divers, family and friends. This is my diving instructor's photos and me. Next, this is me diving in Gozo. Next, this is me in Gozo. Next, what did I get out of it? Learned new skills, teamwork, made new friends, staying calm, repeating and patience, rem remembering, not giving up and believing I can do it. Abu Dhabi. Next. Next. <laughs> um, it has changed my life so much. I have a disability, but I can, I can scuba dive. Other people can scuba dive like me. They will get a lot out of though they will get a lot out of it because there is a whole new world out there for them next other things that i do with still net group oh, next this is my this is not me <laughs> this is my diving but buddy's photos next. Thank you. Any questions? That's the end. Thank you so much, La uh, Layla. That was amazing. Um, and it, yeah, and you know, it's such a great kind of way to kind of go into the next part, which is going to be. Um, everybody um, to share an image of or something um, that 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 in, from the environment that you love, um, because obviously you know uh, there's so many places in the world and and you know to care for it, you know, etc. So I want to start just giving an example of uh, of that, and then we're going to move uh, on to everybody who can. So. Medi um, has a summer house in Finland and she has a few photos. So I'm gonna go to that real quick, uh, share screen. And then everybody can then uh, join in. So this is Medi's, can everybody see it? Summer house. Um, and there's just some, some photos. So Medi, why don't you tell about the summer house? All right, yes, and, and thank you, Leila. That was really wonderful presentation. So interesting, and I'm, I, I would be scared to do scuba diving, so you really <laughs> brave. So, but uh, these photos, so uh, this is from the, um, close to Heinola um, in Finland. We have an island there, and uh, I've basically grown up there all the summers. And uh, and it's so so beautiful. And this is from a uh, uh, midsummer, so you can see in the middle of the night the the sun is shining and uh, it's beautiful. And it, it creates the um, it's 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 place where always where I go, I'm I'm happy. And it just um, brings uh, such a calmness. So. And, uh, and these pictures really remind that what is happening in the world, if this didn't, uh, the, if, if the, this, uh, these lakes and uh, forests and islands weren't any more the same as it has been all my life. So, um, so, so it's really deeply personal. And when it's personal, it also brings real uh, understanding um, kind of experimental like experience about what it would be if it were not there. Uh, that's, 
Yep, absolutely. And um, and I want to now turn to um, who else has um, a photo and want to share, even if you don't have a photo, just very briefly. Um, I have a surprise here. Okay, Riku, yes. Yes. First time I'm going to show something, a picture here. It's a shirt and uh, I want to show you to everybody. Yeah, I know. I'll be sharing. Oh, okay. Poppy's going to, one second, Riku. Poppy's sharing her screen real quick. One second, Riku. Okay. Just one sec. Okay. Wow. Nice, Poppy. Oh, oh beautiful. Did you paint wow. that? Poppy? I, I think she did. Um, Poppy, um, did you paint that? Yeah, I, I, I think Poppy's mic's um, not okay. working, but yeah, she, that, that's one of her pieces of art. She's got quite an outstanding collection, actually, that she's done. Wow. Um, maybe Poppy would be able to share it with you on the um, on the Facebook page. That would be great. Yes, that would be fantastic. Um, um, Marcus, can you, um, so we can see Riku, can you uh stop or poppy can you stop sharing your screen oh they're perfect thank you so much so riku thank you poppy for sharing that was amazing um riku uh you were yes you're up okay here's a view of uh, new york city can everybody see that this is my favorite shirt <laughs> okay and because of that, I have wrote the song just for this meeting. And uh, here it is. I did it in 10 minutes.
Fantastic. Really, really great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I, I want to make sure we get to everybody. So um, does anybody else have an image or song or whatever? Anybody? Yep, Kevin, you're up. Stuff I want to say. That was a good song. You can tell I, me and uh, we were just jamming out here. <laughs> oh, thank um, you. So uh, can I share my screen right now? now or is that like can i do that or share your screen share your screen okay let me just find the uh do 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 i know we gotta do good quick oh here we go ready so this can you everybody see this is um just a couple blocks from where i live it's um it's I believe this was taken during April, or at least in the midst of spring, where you can tell all the colors were just shifting and such. Um, but yeah, I I go there. I used to go there every time coming out of school, on um, you know when it was like warmer weather, spring, summer, and maybe chill autumn season. And I just loved seeing the colors just serene and maybe my uh, camera was a little maybe there was some editing liberties I took there to make it all artsy but this was just a perfect moment for me it was just being there taking it all in just getting lost and that's all I have to say about that thank you great great thank you lovely um, anybody else has an image or a memory or anything um, from a place? Yes, Peter. Oh, yes. Uh, well, we uh, done some tree uh, um, B mix, and all of us done some tree planting some trees in Canterbury. And for the environment and stuff like that, and um, me, Joe, and Matt, everyone went down there to plant some trees in Canterbury, in in the in the college in Canterbury, and we planted loads and loads of trees for environment. Get the trees ready for for environment and keep it um, nice and get it all the trees in, in pet for for the climate climate change and, and stuff like that doing that and, yeah, and I, I remember that so well that was that was several years ago. But, um, but a wonderful experience to share in together mm -hmm. and important for Canterbury, which is a f famous historic city, but sadly uh, is, is very polluted uh, with its air. And um, we felt it was important to do some work like that to help renew uh, the city's air and uh, just be a part of um, making a stand for a, a, a cleaner, um, environmentally healthy Canterbury. Thanks for the reminder, Pete. And plus, we done some uh, like um, going to, into London to buy our voices for the pollution in the, for the planets and stuff like that. And we done some voting for getting some funding for uh, the. Uh, what we done for the big, the big plan, and we done it into the status what we done for Canterbury and the wildlife, and and we done some 
uh, like other things in Canterbury, like the um, Winterbourne. We talk talk about everything about the planet and the earth and saving the um, uh, energy, numeral energy. Now we've got these new cars in Canterbury and everything's got to be changed. And because it's all needs happening now because it's not so, uh, in, in billions of years, the planet will, uh, the water and the, and the, Ice is mounting now. You see it now. It's swinking. Uh, the earth is like making it, and the phosphorus in the air and all the gases are polluting the earth. Mm. We need to challenge everyone to make a difference to everyone in our in our areas to make it happen this year. Well, thank you, Peter. That sounds, and that's absolutely right. And if you have an image you want to send to me, uh, please put it on the, um, uh, my emails on the chat. That would be fantastic. And I want to, um, uh, I want to make sure. It's our, it, me and Matt could do that together. Oh, great. One in B mix, we could do it all together. Perfect. Yeah. If, if you guys, if you all could uh, email me an image, I'm going to make a collage after we're done um, uh, for this, for, and I'll present it next week. I, we have four minutes. So I want to make sure it gets everybody with their hands up. So Adam, um, and then Measley, Cesare, and then Fionn. Um, so uh, Adam, you're up. Thank you. This has been just really, really rich. Thank you so much for paying attention to the environment. Jeez, Louise, the only reason why we're here. Um, here's a quick shot. Um, I used to love taking road trips and uh, at 17 years old, years ago, this is in Washington State uh, in my trusty Volvo wagon. Um, and uh, I love the mountains, especially in Washington State, USA. As well as um, as well as the ocean in um, San Francisco Bay, very cold, very very cold, and of course our beautiful Grand Canyon. Oh, I love uh, I love nature so much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much, and please send me those images. Um, like I said, I'm going to create uh, a collage. Um, uh, who's that? Easily. Hello. Hello. Okay. We're going to try this. Um, I will share with you, um, my pictures when I went to Haiti, um, about two years ago. I I'm from Haiti. I was born on the island of Haiti. And this is on the northern side of Haiti. We were heading out to a small island that's in the middle of the sea. And so that was quite an interesting um, experience. And if you could see, you see the, um, so this is sort of like an inlet where you see all the lush and the greenness. Um, and that's basically the, the island, right? And one of the things that matters to me is that we do we are having some problem with deforestation in Haiti um, because there is still a lot of charcoal production um, that uh, some companies are doing and charcoal production to basically send around the world. And so you can only imagine how that's killing the lush green forests that we have come to love. And also um, because we're on an island, seafood is important and fishing is part of the lifeblood of the community. And so I just wanted to share um, to share that, that this matters to me a lot and keeping it alive and thriving also. Thank you, Neasley. Please send me those photos. Um, uh, Fionn and then Cesare and then Jonathan, yeah. Yes. 
Yo. Where, oh, well, where did you go from? I went, well, four, four years ago to the, to the Amazon in South America. It was the Brazilian part of the Amazon. Yes. And you brought your violin with you. I did, yeah. And played music for the people who live there. Yeah. And that's a big part of what we do. We are Citizen Network international ambassadors. Yes. So we've traveled to a lot of places, but this was one of our favorite trips, of course, obviously. Yeah. And it was really deep in the, in the forest. We were a 30 hour boat ride from Manaus. Yeah. And what were three of the animals that you saw there? Well, I remember seeing all kinds of parrots and, well, co colorful birds of, of all kinds. And I also remember seeing five Five meter long black cinnamon crocodiles. They were mm -hmm. amazing. And the beautiful dolphins, which are pink in the in the Amazon River there. Yes, and we also got got to see giant otters. The thing that impressed me the most is that the people of this village they live in a in a reserve. It's what in the United States would be like a national park. But unlike in the United States, it's called an extractive reserve. So people are welcome to live in the land and to live from the land. So they're, they're allowed to, to fish, to cut down trees if they need the wood to build things, but no one is taking things from the land to make money from it. They're, they're just living in the place in harmony with the environment. And I thought that was a really important lesson for us. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been such a great talk. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you. And please send me the image. Um, that's yes. a fantastic image. Um, the next one is Cesare. Cesare, um, yeah, you're up. Hey all, uh, I just wanna show you this picture. Uh, this is from uh, the Wisconsin River. Oh, wow. Um, Illinois, you, oh, I'm sorry, in Wisconsin. What am I saying? Okay. I'm, I'm in Illinois. But this is from my various canoe trips up there. And they call this river, I think, I, I hope I'm not getting it right because it's been a while since I've been up there, but they call it the, the river of a thousand isles because uh, there are so many different sandbar, like small little sandbar islands and you can go camping on those islands uh, overnight. So you could, you could be staying on your very own island you know and and they actually keep a really good culture over there of cleaning up after yourself and not letting people bring glass so that you can actually walk around and you know barefoot and you don't have to worry about it i mean sometimes people do uh bring trash and they leave it but in general they they police it really well but but this you know it sets an example for how we should be uh, taking care of the rest of uh the natural world and so anyways it, it's really beautiful it's I, I can't even begin to describe it i have some other pictures somewhere else but I, ca I can't pull them up right now but yeah it's it's just there are so many different uh like you could go down this river uh, many times and you would never take the same path because there are there are so many different uh, islands that you can go around so many different uh, weaving paths through the river, it's beautiful, and the and the river changes levels too. It it regularly, you know, sometimes when it floods, a lot of islands disappear, and when it's when the water level is lower, it opens up places that just it, it's always constantly recreating itself. So amazing, amazing! Thank you so much. Thank you, and please. Everybody, um, send uh, to the email Michael Bierman at Strimmerslaboratory com. Like I said, this week, and I will be presenting it for next week. Um, it's 10.05, so that's about the time we have. I first want to say thank you to Chloe, Sue Neal, um, and Layla. Thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Really, really great. Uh, Chloe, can you uh, uh, 
christen or deem somebody the next uh, host for next week, who would you like to have? I think um, my fiance should be the host. Who? Mark. Mark. Oh, yeah. Yay, Mark is the host for next week. Okay, I've got a question. Uh, hold on. Yeah, um, okay. You've got to go. Okay. Quickly. Oh, okay. Hello, me. Got to be quick. Oh, um, do you know this thing that you're talking about, yeah, Marcus? Naomi, hold on one second. We're going to get to you, but I just want to wait one second. Oh, we're sorry. Just... It's okay. Marcus, if you want to uh, plug next week, and then, um, and then, yeah, and then we'll get to Naomi. Okay. So next week, same place, same address, bring a friend and share the news. We are uh, welcoming Fiona Than, so uh, from Ireland. So uh, I, I hope to see all of you uh, here uh, in the Action Monday. So uh, Fiona and Jonathan are here with us and they will uh, tell about their magnificent story to us. So uh, please share the news about this event. So every Monday, Action Monday, Very same nice time, too. same place. So hope to see all of you uh, there. The, the time is now uh, 7 